Thank you, Andrew. Um, this talk had its uh, origin in a holiday I had um, in the middle of East Anglia. And uh, I'll show you in a few seconds um, what I mean. Yes, as I say, I was on holiday in East Anglia near Thetford and uh, I came across a statue and there it is. And I thought I recognized the name. Um, it was or is a statue of a man called Thomas Paine, who wrote a book in 1791 called The Rights of Man. And as I say, it was in the center of Thetford. Clearly, this is where he was born. And uh, it's got something about the rights of man on the side of the plinth. And if we look at the frontispiece from the book that he wrote, um, it's called The Rights of Man, being an answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French Revolution. Uh, so he was obviously uh, somewhat in support of the French Revolution. And if you look then inside, um, it's dedicated to George Washington, President of the United States of America. And he says, Sir, I present you a small treatise in defense of those principles of freedom which your exemplary virtue hath so eminently contributed to establish that the rights of man may become as universal as your benevolence can wish, and that you may enjoy the happiness of seeing the new world regenerate the old. Is the prayer of, sir, your much obliged and obedient humble servant, Thomas Paine. Written, of course, in the sort of language that they had in those days. But nevertheless, this was a work in which um, clearly uh, this Thomas Paine was rather in favour of both the, um, the Republic of America, the new Republic of America and the, and the Republic of France. And at the same sort of time, 1789, uh, there was a declaration of the rights of man under the citizen uh, written by a French general who helped the Americans to fight the British called the Marquis de Lafayette. And so these things developed. And in 1948, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was published. And here's a picture of the widow of President Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, holding a co copy of this Universal Declaration. And so <clears throat> let's look at the context of it. Soon after the end of the Second World War, this document was drafted to co coincide with the establishment of the United Nations. It was influenced by the excesses and the horrors of Nazism, and there are 30 articles in total. <clears throat> uh, I think this is the first one. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. <clears throat> Everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery in the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Now this is the one that's of interest to Christadelphians. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. <clears throat> this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. So the, human, uh, the, the Declaration of Human Rights has some quite important clauses within it. And I think we have to say that we, um, we benefit from this as a religious group, because uh, it is a human right to have freedom of thought, conscience and religion. <clears throat> so what does the Bible say about such matters? Well, here's the commentary of the prophet Isaiah about oppression. This is in Isaiah 58 verses 6 to 7. <coughs> is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, 
to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring your house to your house, the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. So some very similar sentiments here, you might say, between this and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But do you notice there's a change in emphasis? The Bible teaches responsibilities and obligations, not rights. So it's the obligation and the responsibility of people to ensure that those who are less fortunate than themselves are helped. And it's not the right that we have. So a right is something that you demand, whereas a responsibility is something that you do. I should say something that we do rather than you. I'm, I'm not pointing the finger here. Uh, so you can see there's a subtle difference here in emphasis. So let's look at more Bible teaching on such things. In Leviticus 19, we are told, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And can you see that this statement is a consequence? The command is a consequence of God being Lord. So the way that we treat our neighbor is colored by the fact that God is the Lord and that we should be serving him. Now, if you look at the human the Declaration of Human Rights, there's no mention of God at all. So without God in our thinking, we are humanists. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Matthew 22, the words of Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is, of course, a quotation from that Leviticus reading that we had earlier. So you can see that we cannot consider our behavior as human beings without taking God into account. If we don't, as I said at the start, that we are humanists. We only do these things for different reasons. So there's a driving force if we read the Bible, and that is that our attitude to others is determined by our attitude to God. Now I want to look at human rights and democracy. Now, if you remember, I said that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written uh, in, an, in an era when human tyranny had been particularly terrible, and that was the uh, dictatorship of Nazi Germany. And such awful things had been carried out that you can understand the nations wanting to have some sort of rules for human behavior. But interestingly, they have become a reaction against all authority. There's nobody that can stand up and tell anybody else what is right. And the conclusion is that no one has the right to decide law or take life. This has to be decided by the people. So law, therefore, is not absolute. It is merely a whim of popular opinion. So if people at large decided that a particular thing, which is currently um, uh, um, against the law, uh, is now allowable, then the law will be changed. So let's look at God's law. And we're taking a passage from Psalm 19. And this is a whole series of descriptions of God's law, what it is and what effect it should have upon those who observe it. So the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. 
the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So God is the giver of law, not the general public. And if we follow God's laws, they will have a beneficial effect upon us, not only in this life, but in the one to come. And then we ask the question, are we really free? Because one of the um, essential parts of the Declaration of Human Rights is that people should be free from tyranny. Now, unfortunately, we're not free, depending, not, not irrespective of what country we live in in this world. So if you read Romans chapter 5, verse 17, we read that if, for if by one man's offence, death reigned through one. So we are all equal because we are sinners and none of us is free from slavery to sin and death. The Bible's conclusion is that none of us are free. We're all enslaved. We know we're all going to die. And that one man's offence, of course, is talking about the sin of Adam in at the beginning of Genesis. So do we have a right to life? Well, Romans 6, at the end of the chapter, tells us, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wages are something that we earn. We earn death because naturally we are sinners. But through Jesus Christ, God is offering a gift, not a right, but a gift. But it's something we have to turn to and accept and not something we should demand as a right. Adam and Eve's sin was an abuse of the privilege of life that God had given to them. So consequently, none of us has a right to life. And as we said before, life is not a right, but a gift from God. So life is God's gift. And the Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, uh, writes in chapter 15, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are of all men most pitiable. But now has Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We're all in Adam, whether we like it or not. We're in Adam because we are born as human beings. And we all know that the truth of the matter is that we're going to die. But what the Bible is offering and what the, the you know, is life. And that life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're all in Adam because we're born. If we are reborn by baptism into Christ, then we can have a hope of eternal life. And that is because Christ has risen from the dead. And as it says, he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the death of Christ was, in effect, him falling asleep, the sleep of death and he was woken up again from it in resurrection. And the first fruits are the, the indication, the first part of the harvest. And so the great harvest is when Christ returns, uh, when he will raise from the dead those people who are in Christ. So how can we be Christ? We've already alluded to this, but let's look in more detail at Romans chapter 6, the beginning of the chapter this time. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So baptism into Christ is the beginning of a new life. 
It's life which will lead to everlasting life. And that's the wonderful thing. So this is true life and true freedom. We can't get that through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What about equality? Well, in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So while we live in this current age, of course, there are Jews and Greeks. There are people enslaved and people who are free, and there are male and female. But in Christ, there's that prospect that one day all those things will be done away and there will no longer be sin and death and all these other divisions. In Christ, we will all be one. So we've already said that we don't have the right to life, but actually we can have a right. The Bible tells us this because baptism into Christ completely changes our status in God's sight. And we read of this in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. If you remember, at the beginning of Genesis, when Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, God cast them out of the Garden of Eden in case they might take from the tree of life. And that way was then guarded by cherubim. And what this is promising is that one day that way will be opened again and the tree of life will be made available. And that is the wonderful prospect of the Bible hope. So let's just bring our ideas together. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has many good aspects and we can be glad it gives us freedom of religious association. It is, however, a humanist document offering neither freedom nor hope, not true freedom or hope. The Bible is God's word and it offers us both those things. So we are encouraged to follow God's laws because that is what will give us true hope in this world of suffering and death. Thank you very much.